Next speaker uh, will, will be uh, Len Nooney uh, from UC Riverside uh, talking about uh, evolution and cancer suppression. Please. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, actually, this is a project that I started ages ago, more than 15 years ago, and uh, published a couple of things on it and discovered that I was incapable of, of, uh, of convincing the oncologists that evolution had really much relevance uh, to their existence. Uh, but with the, the increase of interest in things like uh, evolutionary medicine and also the techniques that are available, um, it, it became appropriate to, to resurrect it again. Um, so the whole point here is, and it, it actually is, is very similar to the, to, the, uh, to the quote from Dobzhansky that Daphne showed us on the first edition of evolution about what evolution is all, all about. And, I mean, it's really apparent in, in, in cancer biology, which is that, as we all know, cancer biology has been incredibly successful in getting at the nuts and bolts of how things happen, but they really don't have a framework for understanding the differences between different sorts of cancers. And so, I mean, as we all know, an evolutionary framework is, is a way of understanding patterns seen among different things, in this case, different cancers, and the basis for hypothesis testing. Okay, so what are the differences between different Cancer is one of the patterns we see. And in fact, the sort of definitive data started in the 1950s when Nordling um, plotted just cancer incidents against how old you are in a long, long plot. And it gives a slope of a, a for overall cancer of about six, which is consistent with a very simple model saying that seven events happen to, ha to happen before a, a cell becomes oncogenic. And soon after that, Armitage and Dole tested it with specific cancers, and that's some of the pictures on the, on the side, and that's all with a slope of six. And, um, and they showed that it fitted that idea of Nordlings. There were some cancers that clearly didn't fit, however. But what it did do was set the stage for multi-stage carcinogenesis as being the predominant model for understanding how cancer begins. And that is that it requires a set of events, they could be regular mutations, they could be epi mutations, they could be, could be chromosomal rearrangements, but there's a number of events that take that had to occur in a specific cell for cancer to start. Um, but there were clearly exceptions to this idea of seven kids, and, and the most obvious example was the really insightful work of, of Knudsen when he was looking at retinoblastoma, and this is an individual or child who has retinoblastoma in his eye, you can see it when you do flash photography. Um, and he proposed a two-hit model, a much simpler model, where you have a single tumor suppressor called RB, and if you knock both of those copies out in the developing retina, then that individual will get retinoblastoma. So now you only need two mutational hits. What do you need? Two mutational hits, seven mutational hits, or some spectrum. And the cancer biology framework being essentially absent, there's no way of deciding what it should be. Um, so it, just, it was just dropped as a question and, and, and so people moved on. There's a, but there's an, an interesting logical problem with multistage carcinogenesis that was, was captured by uh, Richard Pito in 1977. The point is that multistage carcinogenesis is driven primarily by somatic events. I mean, you may be unlucky and get a familial bad start, but but it's somatic events, and of course, if you are bigger and longer lived, there's more opportunity for somatic events to occur, bad somatic events to occur. So as he pointed out, we're a lot bigger than mice, and we live a lot longer than mice, and so why don't we get a lot more cancer than mice? Um, and I christen this thing Pito's Paradox. <coughs> and first of all, do, is it true? I mean, do big animals have about the same level of cancer as, as small animals? Well, we actually don't have a great deal of really good data, but we can go back to just mice and humans, and you can see that an old mouse gets about as much cancer as an old human. So it, it's sort of what you expect. And of course, the answer to Pito's paradox is trivial. I mean, it's just called adaptation. And so we can create a very simple evolutionary model and as I said, this was not popular with oncologists for some unknown reason, but the idea is that if you imagine circumstances where an organism is being selected to become larger or, or live longer, then a trade-off with that event is that eventually you're gonna start getting more cancer, and it may be some specific cancer that starts increasing in frequency pre-reproductively. 
So you get an increase in cancer, and that's going to drop your fitness. And if that fitness drop is large enough, obviously you get natural selection to stop that, to suppress that effect. And so you're going to get natural selection. But what does that natural selection operate on? Well, it operates on the, the existing genetic variants. Now, what's there? Of course, we can't predict what genetic variance is there. There may be genetic variance for a very general overall cancer-suppressing mechanism that may be selected, or there may be genetic variance for tissue-specific effects that's going to stop that particular cancer. And, and uh, there's generally considered to be a few dozen tumor suppressors, if we just focus on those. And of course, what's there in any particular population, any particular time is going to be completely serendipitous. So we can't predict in advance what's going to happen. So you can't predict how cancer is going to suppress. And of course, that is consistent with what we see, the unusual and in many respects unexpected phenomenon, which is certain genes are, are implicated in one cancer and different genes are implicated in another. And a subset of those may be implicated in another, but then there's a different set as well. And so there's no sort of logical rhyme or reason, but we don't really expect that. So one of the things that I was interested in doing was looking at, at whether we could begin to get a handle on this serendipitous recruitment. But we needed to, to have some idea of how we could find out whether something might be implicated in cancer suppression anyway, particularly for tumor suppressors. So with a graduate student, Brian Neer and myself, we started looking at expression data. Now the stuff I'm going to tell you about is, is sort of an early sort of metadata set across many, many labs. Um, but looking at expression of 15 tumor suppressors in 12 different human tissues, and uh, we also did proto genes, but I don't have time to talk about that. But uh, the genes were specifically chosen because they were linked to a high risk of a specific inherited cancer. So you've got a gene, you already know if it's mutated in a particular way, that gives you a high probability of getting a specific cancer. And so what we wanted to find out was was that marked in any sense by an increased expression of that particular tumor suppressor in that particular tissue? So that the, is the expression in the susceptible tissue in the highest ranked expression group across tissues. We have to use non-parametric methods, so that's the reason for that. And the answer, somewhat surprisingly, because this has not been demonstrated before, somewhat surprisingly, we found it's not an absolute result, but there's clearly a, a, a tendency for this. So the the white bars are the expression of the susceptible tissue of a gene in the, in, the, in the tissue in which it can cause cancer if it's mutated. So we notice that in, in all the ones on the, on the left hand side, there's a clear difference between expression of the susceptible tissue and the average across the other 11 tissues. It gets fuzzy in the middle and then sort of falls apart. But there is a clear and highly significant tendency for the overexpression in the susceptible tissue. So at least in some cases we're getting signal. And as I said, this is the first time, so it gives us something to work on, and we're, we're continuing this work at the moment. Okay, we're well going back in time. What I did when I first started this was to try and model, to try and work out what, how many steps in the, uh, the multi-stage carcinogenesis do you expect in a particular set of circumstances. And I did some relatively simple modeling, and the simplest form of that simplest modeling is this particular result here, where we're just saying, let's suppose there's M over 2 identical tumor suppressors. Each tumor suppressor requires two <coughs> mutations to knock it out, because there's two copies. So we require M mutations, the tissue is of size C, and there's K divisions through life, and you have a somatic mutation rate. And you get an, actually a nice simple answer, and we can interpret that, and it, it states the obvious which is that the risk of cancer increases linearly with body size. That is, if you double your, the number of cells in your body, you're going to double the risk of cancer. It's a power function driven by the number of mutations with lifespan, assuming that lifespan is related to the number of cell divisions that have occurred. And similarly, it's a power function of the somatic mutation. And in fact, there are a number of cancers who are linked to changes in the somatic, <coughs> increases in the somatic mutation rate, as we might expect. So this is just formalizing what I've been saying already. But one of the questions that I was worried about was, was in fact this whole logical framework that I'm using correct? We were size and longevity risk factors. We know longevity is a risk factor, a massive risk factor. And um, 
But size was a problem. When I first did this, there was no definitive evidence that size in humans affected cancer risk. That is no longer true. I think we can definitively say that height is a, a strong cancer risk. It's the one area where short men have some sort of advantage relative to tall men. <laughs> and, uh, but, but this is actually the data from the million women study, so it's all women, this is on overall cancer risk. And what this actually demonstrates, this is going up in height, this is uh, relative risk. What it means is that you increase your overall cancer risk by a, between about 10 to 15 percent for every 10 centimeters that you gain in height. So it isn't a trivial effect. And it actually affects a whole range of cancers. And I, I have a slide, I don't have time to show. Okay, so is this sort of approach useful? I'm just going to mention one part of a really nice study. There's one, a pair of uh, researchers at Rochester, uh, Andre Saloano and Vera Gorbanova, who actually took my suggestions to heart and, and examined, as I'll show you in a second, with this clade of rodents. Now, I mean, the, back, the background to this is, many of you may have heard that humans have what's called telomerase suppression, and that limits the number of cell divisions that, that our cells can go through, and it's considered to be an anti-cancer mechanism. Mice do not have telomerase suppression. Those were the two data points, basically. And you can do nothing with them. I mean, what does it mean? It's like, we're different, and that's about it. What they did was they looked at cells from this range of rodents and measured the level of telomerase. And what you find is this astonishingly good relationship to size. So now it puts it in perspective. You notice the beaver and the capybara, the two largest rodents, are sitting down there with the greatest telomerase suppression. They also are actually looking at the naked mole rat, which has proved to be a very pr sort of productive uh, area that I don't have time to go into because they live for a long time, but they have other mechanisms for apparently suppressing cancer. Okay, so why does cancer persist? Believe it or not, many oncologists ask this question from time to time and put forward blatantly group selection arguments for the fact that it's good at getting rid of evil genes and things. Um, so. Uh, but we can, at least as a sort of null hypothesis, just raise two issues. The first is early onset familial cancer is just simply mutation selection balance for the large part. We're all familiar with that. What I did was develop a much messier relationship with mutation selection balance when you have a bunch of tumor suppressors controlling that one trait of cancer in a particular tissue. Um, but it gives you a baseline for saying we know roughly how common these things should be. If they're way above that, that means something else is going on. As <laughs> also, we can say that <coughs> onset cancer, obviously, as organisms go through their reproductive life, the effectiveness of natural selection is going down. So ultimately, if you like, when you're in old age, way past reproductive, you're sort of on your own. Natural selection hasn't set you up very well. <laughs> And the one, in, and that's sort of obvious, but the one interesting result that comes out of this is for post-reproductive cancers, which is that we, the, the model clearly predicts that big rapidly dividing tissue, tissues, which actually need the most suppressors to stop you getting cancer pre-reproductive, will have the highest post-reproductive risk, even though there's no pre-reproductive increase. And that's because natural selection will get you one or two mutations away from disaster pre-reproductively. But if that tissue continues to divide very, very rapidly and has a lot of cells, the likelihood is post-reproductively you'll get those additional mutations. If you have a little slow dividing tissue, it's one or two away from disaster, but it won't do much post-reproductively so you don't get those cancers. So just to finish up, cancer, the main thing is cancer suppression is an evolving trait. And that's the simple message that I would like to try and get across, and the rest is just a statement of what I've just been saying, and I just really want to uh, <coughs> advertising. So we have uh, just about to come out for the topical transactions, a whole issue on this topic. So thank you very much. Yes.